Good morning. How's everyone? I feel like it's next Wednesday. I'm here 24 hours. Um, see all these folks behind me? Happy faces. <laughs> well, before we begin our, our press conference today, I wanted to announce that we're registering for summer camps in Baltimore. And last year, I think we had over 3,000 mm -hmm. young people who registered for summer camps. And so we're open for enrollment. I want to thank Bill Vondersack, our interim director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Tracy Epstep, where's, where's Tracy? Hi, Tracy. Hi. She's the chief of recreation operations for our city of Baltimore. And then Rashawn Brave is here with us, uh, the division chief of youth and adult sports. Do you have running as a sport? Yeah. Look, I'm just checking. <laughs> Who's the fastest person in Baltimore? Does anybody know? The running man. Who is? <laughs> the running man. He's not the fastest. He is by no means. <laughs> no, he's not the fastest. But you all should know who that is because we should have. Uh, we should find out who is the fastest person in Baltimore. Y'all should have a contest for that. Bob Wall is here. He's the Bureau Chief for Recreation, the running man. Uh, recreation and Parks. <laughs> he runs very slow, by the way. Uh, for many families, uh, this really is cost prohibitive, but not for Baltimoreans. We're very enthusiastic uh, to announce the third year. And so not only is it a camp where you can have fun, it's also academic enrichment. And that's what we need for our children. So we encourage them to register today. Is there a deadline for registration? June 1st. June 1st is the deadline. So we're trying to announce these things early because we want people to know about them. We want them to go on the website, uh, bcrp.baltimorecity.gov. Let me repeat that. <laughs> bcrp.baltimorecity.gov or by visiting their nearest recreation center. Uh, again, we want our students to enroll by uh, June 1st. Uh, we were very excited about the various camps, and uh, we want to thank our, our, our crew for continuing to do this and understand the needs of our young people. Recreation is important. Academics, of course, as we well know, is important. But that's what these camps provide. They do go on trips, and so we want the families to engage, and more importantly, that our young people get a chance to enrolled in a camp. We also, for your information, have about 11,000 children who have applied to work this summer. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that all of those children who want to work get to work. And I think you all have heard me say before that uh, this is something that's very important to me. I've talked to companies and corporations and I've said to them it's just not enough to throw money our way. I want them to give our young people the experience of coming in their companies and corporations. But today, it's about summer camp. I know today also feels like a summer day, but it's not. <laughs> um, but they can begin enrollment. So everything's open. Bill, did you want to share anything? Yeah, just a couple of things, and then <laughs> Tracy's going to um, share a couple of details. Uh, just a couple other numbers. What do I? I'm stretching this T-shirt. <laughs> So we put these on this morning, and I walked around. Everybody had a good laugh, and this was this was the bigger shirt. What y'all give? Um, some, it's like a child shirt. All right, go ahead. But you know, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. She adjusts me. She does have a fashion background, I understand. Um, you know, three or four years ago, we had 1,700 kids in our summer camps, and with Tracy and Rashawn and Bob's leadership, we're up to 3,400 kids. And this year we're shooting for 38, maybe 4,000 kids. So just wanted to share that number. The other thing is, as the mayor mentioned, um, the young adults that were giving summer jobs, Tracy hires 240 of them to help run these uh, summer camp programs. We hire another 100 to work in the parks. So there's just some numbers to put uh, some context to it. And we invite you all out. I think it's gonna be August 9th at the end of the year all 3,400, 3,800 of these kids are going to be in Druid Hill Park for the culminating event, and it's quite a thing to see. Can we have a racing contest? I'll do a little speed <laughs> sure. off with the, with sure. the press. Okay. Sure. Right. So, Tracy, you want to share some details? Good morning. As long as it's not some funny, I won't say it. Go ahead. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> we are excited about summer camp at Rock and Parks. The weather will be great, the pools will be open, and people will be out enjoying our parks and programs. On top of that, we have an opportunity to serve the youth through our summer camp, Camp Baltimore. Each year, 
Camp Baltimore continues to increase its impact when youth in Baltimore. As Bill stated, we have doubled our camp enrollment since 2013. If you're looking for a safe space for your kids, Camp Baltimore offers academic enrichment, exploration, nature, sports camps, and clinics, and Camp Variety, our therapeutic camp. We offer academic enrichment, field trips, nature outings, sports, swimming, cultural events are all a part of our summer camp experience. Here's what parents need to know to register. We have two types of camps academic enrichment camps and specialty camps. Registration opens today, March 1st, in our 39 academic enrichment camps. Walk-in is for return campers only. Tomorrow, March 2nd, registration is walk-in and online and it's open to all campers. You can find details or information about our camps at our link at bcrp.baltimorecity.gov. I want to reiterate that the 39 academic enrichment camps are free to Baltimore City residents. Parents, this camp is affordably priced and, and non-city residents can apply also. We'll charge them. But there is a fee <laughs> for non, there is a fee for non-city residents. Specialty camps are fee-based and trips and meals are included. The leadership of Baltimore City Recreation and Parks wants to thank Mayor Catherine Pugh for her support. We also want to thank our staff, the center directors, programmers, managers, maintenance, service providers, and anyone who has a hand in making our summer camp a success. We want to thank the parents for entrusting us with your most precious treasure, your children. We recognize the importance in continuing to provide quality services during the summer months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, open for questions. Madam Mayor, the Annapolis delegation will have a bill this Friday, Dirk will hold a hearing on bill this Friday, uh, that would return full control of the police department to the city. Is that something that you have entertained in the past? Absolutely not. Why not? Why should I? Well, I would imagine as... Let me just say, we've got a lot of issues in the city. And if you're following the issues of the city, we have a DOJ consent decree that we're waiting to be signed currently, which will come with a minimum $11.5 million price tag annually. Um, I think it would be to your advantage to understand, as it would be to anybody's advantage to understand why we operate the way that we currently do with the police department. I have full control of the police department in the sense that I get to appoint the police commissioner. I get to sit and negotiate with the FOP as it relates to the kind of contract that we ultimately will have. You know, when there are things as it relates to the police department that are concerning to me, I will take my team to Annapolis to focus on it. And so that is not something that I'm interested in at this particular stage of the game. What I said that I'm interested in right now is control of the city school board. But that's, but that's where I am. There's a catch-22, though. There's no catch-22. That's where I am. But don't you have to wait till the General Assembly session if you need to change something as a result of the consent decree, you only have between, as you know, January and April to have the delegation or the General Assembly to submit something. For what? What do I need the General Assembly to submit something for the if there's consent something, decree? If there's something in the consent decree that's governed by state law, you can't. The, the, what is in the consent decree is what we've agreed upon. What is in the consent decree, and I hope that you've read it, is how we improve, train our police department, create community uh, relationships, and to the extent possible, to have citizens on the trial boards. I have a bill in the General Assembly as it relates to two individuals sitting on the trial boards. I intend to get through the negotiations with the police department before the General Assembly ends because I don't want to get engaged in collective bargaining. But what I do want are two citizens on the trial boards. Okay. okay. Mayor, where do you stand on the um, minimum wage that's supposed to be voted on a committee today? <clears throat> Have you um, uh, decided whether you will sign, veto? 
here's where I am on the minimum wage. Um, one of the things that I've uh, asked them to look at is a training wage. Uh, because we've got so many people unemployed in the city, 76,000 people currently unemployed, not working. And I would hope that the council would take in consideration all of the constraints that the city currently is under. The <coughs> DOJ, uh, again, which comes with a price tag that was not in the budget last year that we will put in the budget. Uh, the concerns about the Baltimore City Public Schools and what we will ultimately dedicate to them, not for one year, but over the next three years. So. I have to see the bill in its entirety. I'm also um, looking for economic impact. I tell folks that um, running the city gives new meaning to what my mother used to say to me when we were growing up. You can't get blood out of a turnip. I didn't know what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. So my little wide-eyed self would just continue to stare at her. And she said, what do you think I have, a money tree that I can shake, 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 and the money can come tumbling down? City doesn't have one either. My parents didn't have one. But what I do have is fiscal responsibility, fiduciary responsibility for the city. So I will make sure that whatever is being offered by the city council, whatever obligations that we make as it relates to the school system and the DOJ, these are things that we have already said that we will do. I'm, I, and I will share with you all, as Maggie has said to us, our chair of the um, Appropriations Committee in Annapolis, uh, we have agreed on what the city will do. However, we are still negotiating with the state. I, I heard the comments that the governor made as it relates to the school system. And, you know, I can't lay all of that on the foot of this particular CEO of the school system, but there is some transparency required. Um, there were some issues as it relates to the public school system. And I know that there are things that have been fixed, but at the same time, when we talk about structural deficits and deficits, we need to be clear in terms of what that means. You know, and oftentimes we get it wrong when people throw out large numbers and talk about a structural deficit. The city has a structural deficit. The state has a structural deficit. The United States of America has a structural deficit. What that says is that you have some issues as it relates to your debt. If you don't figure out how to fix them, you can find yourself in trouble. Even with the city's structural, def, um, structural deficit, we maintain a double A bond rating because we've learned how to manage our debt. So the question becomes, what is the number that the school system needs to continue to operate? And so those are the things that I'm working with the state legislature and we'll continue to work with the governor on. Can you disclose at all what number you're looking at in the city? Well, what, let me just say, and, and I will, and I think Maggie said it best on um, Monday, <coughs> that we want to make sure that we have an agreement with the governor first. And so uh, I think she said we have another week or two, two weeks before we reveal what that number is because we, it has to go into the, into the state budget. Madam Mayor, how did this happen in the first place? What? The $130 million shortfall with city schools. I don't run the school system. We pay our CEO pretty well to run the school system. And as I said to BUILD and the organizations who came here to tell me what we should be given the public school system, I said you should be sitting down with the CEO of the school system and helping them to understand. You know, when I talk about taking back control of the school system, it's the board of directors of the school because we need to understand fiduciary responsibility. We shouldn't see ourselves in this position. As I said, we have a structural deficit, but we have a finance department that understands how we structure things over a period of time so that we don't find ourselves in a position that we can't cover our obligations on a daily basis. And that's what they have to figure out how to do. What has the CEO told you about how city schools got into the shortfall? Much of it she's inherited. You know, it, she walked in, what, just about, uh, has it been a year yet? Not quite. Not quite a year. Yeah, not quite a year. A little longer than I have. Does uh, the governor's comments on um, the IL yesterday indicate um, some challenges that you're encountering when negotiating with him? I mean, he used such strong language that the school finance is an absolute, absolute disaster and that there's been no fiscal accountability. I think he was referring to uh, what uh, Sandalisa encountered when she came into 
that position. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think there was discussion about overtime that was uh, taken that there seems to be no accountability for, but that doesn't preclude him from assisting us. I mean, she came in and got assistance immediately because she was brand new. Um, here we are a, a year, almost a year later, and we're looking at a structural deficit that is, has grown bigger. You know, the issue is we have a reduced population of, of young people attending public schools. We have, Baltimore City has more charter schools mm -hmm. And we love charter schools, but we have more charter schools than the entire state of Maryland, which gets a higher per pupil um, monies for each of their students. Uh, so we need to, as a city, decide how do we equalize education across the board? Because public schools don't get a chance to choose. And so we have to equalize education and make sure the resources are there for all of our children. And so I'm hoping that as we, uh, come to the rescue of the school system over the next three years, and that will come with a need for transparency and accountability for the dollars that are given to them, that they set up a system that uh, can give complete confidence by the city and the state in the monies that's being given to the school system. I know that working with Maggie that we're going to come to, uh, I believe, a solution to these problems. So are charter schools taking money away from traditional public schools in the city? Well, let me, we have 30 charter schools. <clears throat> Montgomery County, for example, has two. Uh, so I'm saying that charter schools are public schools, uh, but we need to make sure that even in the charter schools and the public schools in the city, that we're equalizing education and that we're paying close attention to how we're spending our dollars. Dollars need to end up in the classrooms. You know? And when you have dwindling populations, you have to make adjustments, and those adjustments need to be made. You know, even when, and, and you all should, I don't know, some of you may not know this, in 1997, we separated the school city's budget from the state's budget. The school cities, I mean, from the city's budget. So the school's operating budget currently is $1.2 billion. The city's operating budget is $2.6 billion. But out of our $2.6 billion, we also contribute another $300 million to the school system. Plus, I mean, we take care of their um, crossing guards. We take care of their pensions, uh, all of those things. And the question becomes, how do we maintain our financial status as a city, and how do we make sure that our structural deficit as a city doesn't get out of control? Because I've got police, I've got fire, I've got trash, and all the other services that the citizens of Baltimore deserve, and we intend to be able to do that. But Mayor, for years, mm -hmm. the city has gotten by on it by doing the minimum. And so it ranks as one of the lowest contributors to education in the state. Mm -hmm. The optics of that are obviously pretty harsh, where you've got twice as much money going to policing every year as you do to from city taxpayers to support its schools. Are you comfortable with that formula? Absolutely not. I mean, and one of the things that you'll see us get a handle on, Jane, is overtime for police officers. I mean, we have to make our citizens safe in our city. We've got to reduce crime, but we also have to take out of the police department, those individuals who are doing civilian jobs. You know, they can go back on the street while we can put monies in other places uh, that are important. Um, and we have to control our overtime budget. We had last year $1.6 million every other week going to overtime for police officers that resulted in a $40 million overtime budget. It's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable, and those are, and I don't want to get into a whole lengthy discussion around the police department because we are in negotiations. And I said this to you all earlier. I work seven days a week without a blink. Okay, four and three is just to me. It's not what police departments do. Fire departments do that, not police departments. So we're in negotiations, and I don't want to put damper on negotiations, but we have to get a handle on what we're spending on police because I am a firm believer that education is the key to how we change the trajectory of our children. And so we will increase our budget towards um, education, but at the same time, we've got to get a handle on our finances as well. 
But what we do know is even in our structural deficit position that we've been able to deal with the problems moving forward and we'll do a greater job at it. Now taxpayers in Carroll County, Baltimore County, Howard County who hear about the possibility of more state funds going to city schools, why should they see that as a good investment of tax dollars? Because we're, we're all partners. We're in one state and we're all partners. If Baltimore City does great, so does the rest of the state. Um, we've got to educate all of our children in this state. As you well know, I was a state senator, so I've worked on behalf of all children. When I said move to compulsory attendance age to 18, it wasn't just for Baltimore City, it was for the entire state of Maryland. So all of us should want every jurisdiction in the state to do well. And we've had some shortcomings in our school system as it relates to dollars. We've certainly had shortcomings in terms of buildings that need to be rebuilt. And I think that if we focus more on educating all of our children in our communities, we'll have better outcome for all of us. How would you characterize the governor's willingness to work with you or the delegation to get more money here? Great. He's been great to work with? Uh, oh. Great. <laughs> you put all of them in one in barrel. You said the governor, the I mean, the general yeah. sim. Well, let me just say my my conversations with the governor have always been good, mm -hmm. and um, he recognizes the importance of children, and uh, ultimately I think that he will help us to close this gap. Um, but I think when people have an opinion and they feel that they need to express it, they should be allowed to do so. So speaking of uh, spending, the Pimlico study came out on Friday. Um, we spoke about that at the last conference you had. But since then, we've spoken to the owners of the track, and they said that they're not willing to invest in the track unless they get uh, pretty substantial help from the state and the city. Um, how much money, if any, is the city interested in, in spending on upgrading the facilities there? So the second part of the study will outline where monies can come from. Mm -hmm. I think private, public, partnerships will change that. Um, states have always come to the aid of stadiums and so forth, as we did uh, the stadiums that currently exist in Baltimore. And, you know, I would look for that same kind of support. The uh, Preakness is historical uh, in Baltimore. And the great thing about it is in spite of all of this, and the study shows that, the increase in the turnout at the Preakness continues to go up every year. Went up 18,000 people last year in the mud and the rain and uh, boots. Uh, so I, I just think uh, it is the place to be. And what the study also said is that in spite of all of those things, that there's no reason why the Preakness should leave Baltimore. So I'm looking forward to have a conversation with the owners. Madam Mayor, um when you first went into office, came into office, we asked you about plan to sell four parking garages to fund recreation in the city. Did you have a chance to examine that? I believe personally that, um, first of all, um, I don't know, have you been to the C.C. Jackson New Recreation Center? Uh, not lately. When were you there? Uh, is that the one in Northeast Baltimore? No, it's in Park Heights, so you haven't been there. Oh, have, uh, no, 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 uh, no, 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 okay, so have you been to the new James Mosier Field? That one I have not. Okay, have you been to the new Under Armour Gym on Fayette Street? No. I okay, all right, so my point exactly, you all. So not only did we bring back $29 million for new uh, recreation facilities in the city, we're building them. And you should, take, you should go and take a look at them. And on Pennsylvania Avenue, that slanted field um, that's there at the end of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, we're gonna level that field, create a, a baseball field, football field for the young people who live in that community. So we're doing more than most people know. I think one of Baltimore's biggest problems is his inability thus far to really talk about the great things that are happening in the city. So uh, we're doing it, we're working on it, and we have expanded plans for it. Where are you gonna sell the parking garages? <laughs> I'm not looking at selling assets at this point. You know, we're reviewing all of that. You know, I think oftentimes when we think uh, that we need to solve a problem, it's about selling something. Uh, assets are important. They're, they're, they contribute to the AA bond rating. Uh, so we're looking at all of those things. How would you rate the city council's performance so far? I haven't. I really haven't. I haven't given it any thought. Okay. Good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> See you.